Okay, good morning. If you fancy a coffee, leave us a survey. That's the only chance to, to win your coffee, except you pick up one there. Um, and with that, thank you very much for joining us early after the Pink concert for learning the fundamentals of distributing data cloud solutions. Us, that is my friend and colleague, Christian Sandor Knapp, um, and my name is Daniel, Daniel Stange. Um, we're both Salesforce MVPs, we both work for the same company, DL Digital Consulting, and a side partner in Germany, and we investigated a bit how data clouds, uh, data kit work under the hood. Christian, what do you have in mind today? Well, we packed a session full of details, and before we overwhelm you a little bit, don't fret, we have a README on the GitHub repository, which we'll sh share with you with the end. So imagine you have the craziest and coolest data cloud solution, you harmonize the heck out of your data lakes, and now you actually want to transport that functionality to someone else. Today we're going to show you what you need to know to get prepared and started. We will go into the development workflow and we will be talking about distribution and deployment, also automated deployment. So the first question is the who, how, and what. So who is this for? Basically for everyone who wants to transport data cloud assets from one work to another, but not for people who want to use sandboxes. Because for sandboxes there's now a beta called DevOps data kits. Today we will be talking about so-called standard data kits and they are available to customers as iPartners and ISV partners. Customers might want to transport data cloud assets due to org migrations or because they have multi-orgs. As I partners want to ramp start the projects and ISV partners might want to earn some money via app exchange. So everyone can use standard data kits in these situations. Now what is a standard data kit and how does it work? Uh, it's a matroshka doll, actually. <laughs> so you start with your org, and in your org you install a package. In the package there will be a standard data kit, and within the standard data kit there will be templated assist. And with that package you can then move data cloud assets from org to org. Data cloud features nine types of functionality that you can currently put into data kits. The newest ones is segments, which means data cloud is soon making available also activations for packaging, but for now you need to understand you can package what you see there and everything beyond that you will need to configure manually in your org. How does that end-to-end -end user work? So imagine Team Cody. Team Cody has had a brilliant idea on how to create a new segment, and they will go and create the functionality in their data cloud org. After that, they will create a new data kit, give it a name, and add pieces that are necessary for the segment to function to the data kit. After that, you package the data kit, and after you package it, you need to release it, of course, and then you can install it into org. Now Team Cloudy on the other side wants to use the data cloud assets in their org and they will of course first of all install the package and here's the tricky part, they also need to understand the dependencies of those templated components within the data kit and deploy them in the right order. Once that is done, you can then create the segment from the data kit, we have a demo later on so you have a uh, clear picture of that, how it works. And then, and that's a special thing about data kits and templates, you could actually also adjust the functionality in Builder. That's a huge difference to how packaging works in most cases, because usually packaging changes things in your org immediately and st it starts working in a different way, not with data kits. After that, you can use your segment, obviously, in your activations, and you are done for. Now, the next question is what about those packages and we can't go into much detail today because it's a very short session but suffice to say that there's two types of packaging available for data kits historically one generation packaging which requires a packaging org and since recently also second generation packaging which allows a source driven approach meaning you pull the metadata for the data kits to your computer or repository and build the package from there now what do you need to get started and what should you know? What's right for you? Well, first of all, you need to know that you should talk to a person who knows what's right to you and that might be your account executive. You will have to have an understanding which additions are allowing you to do what 
and there's also the special thing about skill sets. So for first generation packaging, you can go with an admin persona because everything works in an org and if it's along, as long as it's just a few personas working in the org, it works fine. For second GP packaging, you will need a little bit more of a developer mindset and skill set, including metadata-driven development as well as continuous integration, maybe. But how does development actually work, Daniel? Yeah, that's a big question because we're, uh, since the Salesforce command line came into play, we are used to pull things, hack anything, everything in our VS Code environments or IDEs, and then push it back to the org, put everything into um, a repository, and that's not exactly um, how it works when you're built for data cloud data kits. First of all, data cloud metadata is already supported by the metadata API and also um, by source tracking. So you can push and pull everything, all the type, metadata types that we have. And also, as Sandor mentioned uh, at the beginning, we already have the DevOps data kits that allow send, um, to deploy from sandbox to sandbox or from sandbox to production. So why do we actually need data kits then at all? Data kits are a feature that help data cloud to abstract when you work with unrelated orgs. So it, it delivers the feature, the layer that uh, gives the abstraction and the portability for assets to be moved from one org that is not related to the other, that doesn't have the same data cloud backbone in the end, the data lake structures and so on. So with data kits, you have, the, uh, you have a method to ensure compatibility across the orgs with the target org. Um, it allows you to decompose a larger, uh, larger um, implementation into consumable smaller parts. And that is, really, um, that is really one big thing because it's not just one package that you install. You bring a package which contains a data kit and from that data kit you can pick the assets that you want to use, make customizations and install it. So it gives you much more liberties to actually choose what you want and adjust them. That is very important here. Here's an example what, a, what happens when you create an asset in data cloud. This, uh, this thing is a data lake object and you can see it's a pretty simple definition what it is. It's a file on an AWS S3 container. Um, it has a fancy name that we gave it to them and that's what we can pull from the, uh, from the metadata API. Now, if we put this data lake object in a data kit, look what happens. It changes, it not, doesn't even change the format. You can see that it's getting more complex, more description, that is exactly more metadata that other orgs cannot know about that data source that is added. But it also changed the name. There's a one attached to that. And that is not just a tiny change, it is replicated, it exists a second time in that data cloud. And that's what makes the development workflow, in particular the source-driven development workflow, a bit different from what we know because everything that we have exists twice and we have to filter that accordingly to make our workflow work. Um, and because of that and because of dependency spidering, developing data kits is actually done best from the UI in that old um, package, uh, package user interface that you all know from first generation packaging. You can theoretically deploy um, all supported uh, metadata uh, types, but the kind of functionality that you get from deploying that widely depends from to which org you push, um, and if you push things into a scratch org, then you can actually use it there, but if you want to use it productively, then you have to go back and install the package to actually use the functionality productively. What's good to know about um, developing in particular in a source-driven way is Force ignore file is the essence of uh, what you have to here maintain because there's a lot of noise coming through. If you pull for the first time, you will see a lot of metadata types and changes coming in, and you have to filter out specifically what you, want, uh, what you need to support your packages to make the packaging process work. And to make the, uh, and to make the packaging process work, you need orgs to validate. So scratch org creation takes a lot of time when you spin up a fresh data cloud um, enabled scratch org. That is basically because of the AWS infrastructure in the background, but also due to tap package installs for the standard data model. So in, in general, what we, uh, what we need to build a package with data cloud assets in it 
is a manifest-driven development, and that is the biggest change uh, as compared to the standard source-driven development that we do. We rely on uh, on um, on the um, on source tracking mostly. For packaging with Data Cloud, you should know what you want to use and put it in the package XML as a manifest for the package that you will build. Otherwise, you will end up with packages that are very, very hard to control. Now that we have a term package, we end up and want to distribute it. Of course, and for that, we're going to go into demo mode a little bit after I give you a short oversight of what is actually happening in terms of packaging. Now, first of all, you need to understand that there's one golden rule which applies to first generation packaging as well as second generation packaging, and that is you can only put data kit components into those packages, full stop. You can't put Apex in there, you can't put custom objects in there. This is really strict. Now, Daniel already explained to you that for second generation packaging, you need to have a manifest file. Those will be soon documented, otherwise you can look them up a little bit in the repo, but your mileage may vary. First generation packaging currently has the additional, well, uptake that it does the spidering for you. So while first generation packaging might not be as sexy for ISVs, it seems quite sexy currently for standard data kits. And once again, please be aware that deployed data kits components cannot be used within the one JP orgs. You can't really do source driven development with one GP as you would in the old ISV days. Okay, now we have our package, we released it, and what's really, really important to repeat here is once again, after you install a package containing a standard data kit, there is nothing changing in your org at first. So there will need no be additional consumption prices, additional costs, because you are in control. You need to deploy components first, and to deploy components you have basically two options. One option is a little bit older, that's the manual deployment, which we'll be demoing in a minute, and there's the automated deployment now since August via Flow, so you get the latest, greatest, hottest things here in our session. Let's assume I installed my package, let's assume I have created a batch transform, I go into the Data Cloud UI, I click Create from Data Kit, I click Next, and then I already see the templated component. And what's important comes here, as soon as I select that, I am in the builder, I can change the template to my needs. I could go from outgoing calls into incoming calls if I wanted to, we don't today. But once I have made my decision that everything is okay and I made sure it would work for my use case, I can save it and have now my new batch strata transform within my org. Now this was deploying one component. As you know, data kits can consist of many components, and if we want to save time, we will actually do some automation there. And that's now totally possible doing, uh, being done by flow. Mainly we are two ways. There's two ways to call flows. Um, well, you could build a screen flow. We will also focus on flows via Apex today and call the flow via REST RPA. We remember that we need to be aware in which order we need to deploy the components. So if you script that, please script it in the correct order. Now, how does it actually look like? The magic of the flow is twofold. First of all, the dark blue arrows tell you there is logging. So whatever happens, you will have a log, you can query the log after the transaction and find out if everything is peachy or if there was an error. In the middle, there's a little bit of uh, magic of cell source because I don't know what the deploy action actually does, but it will then create the actual implementation from our template. Now, how does the Apex code like? Should, how does the Apex code look like should you want to use it? Well, you will need to use the deploy input component class, which comes with the SF data kit package, which again comes pre-installed in every data kits org. And you need to understand that for each part of your template, you have a one definition that starts with a deploy component input. For example, data lake object in line two. You see you will have to do also a deploy component DLO config in line four. So that means there are complex types in Apex and you need to look them up in the documentation to uh, use them successfully. And they differ between components. From line eight on, you see the data stream bundle. And as you can see, there are different properties to be filled in order for the things to work. Now, calling the flow in the end is 
straightforward. It works just as documented for any flow. You create your input list. You would put there the deploy component input classes and create a list map of that and then actually execute the installation by calling the flow interview. And as we learned just ago, a second ago, you have logs, you will see how the transaction works. Now, if you are somehow want to trigger that from externally, not from within your org, then you also can go and call it via REST API. Please be aware REST API needs you to be authenticated. The payload is pretty similar to what we have seen uh, in the Apex classes. And um, again, please, please, please do it in the correct order. Otherwise, things will fail and the functionality will not be there. It's time to wrap up, Daniel. Yeah, what did we see and learn today and what did we share to you today? Um, the first, the first and most important thing that you have to understand about data kit development is a data kit contains templates for assets, not the actual asset implementation themselves. A data cloud data kit can only contain assets and metadata types that belong into that data kit. No other things. If you do that, it will fail. Data cloud components, uh, the data kit components, can only be converted into assets and used productively if you deploy them as a package to a productive environment. That's a strict rule. It won't work to push the data kit via API. You have to, um, whoops. The standard workflow that we have for the command line typically does not really work well when developing for data kits. You have to adapt a bit, you have to learn the specialities, and you can lead up on this in our repo. And let's look into the resources that we, um, that we have created for you. Um, as a next step, I highly recommend to go check first with the repo. If you want to have the slides, you can um, scan the QR code, and there are the slides. But the repo itself contains the whole journey that Sandro did for engineering and reverse engineering and learning all the steps the hard way. Um, the first uh, the thing that you want to find out when you want to start with packaging for data kits is your relation to Salesforce, what you want to do and what you, uh, what you are entitled to have. And then you can, with the information, decide is first generation packaging, is second generation packaging the right thing for me, and which one is even available for me. The most important thing, your relation to Salesforce it determines which orgs you can get for testing, and you have to get your orgs for developing and testing. That is very important. And with that, we're at the end. If you have any questions, we'll be around at the site for quite a while. Um, we hope you enjoy your last day of Dreamforce. We'd be happy to have your survey responses to give some, get some feedback, and this could earn you some coffee at Starbucks. And with that, thank you very much for coming. Enjoy the last day. Have fun with data kits. <laughs>